you love us so much. I pray, Lord, that you would gracefully come upon me now to share your word so that what is in my heart and what is in my head would be complementary to what you want to say and that you would restrain me from foolishness, from inappropriateness, from things that would not be helpful or not in be enhancing to us as individuals. Lord Jesus, I pray for you to, you would protect our minds so that as we hear your word, it would be sown in good soil that would bring about in us transformation of a life. Thank you, Lord, you love us so much. And I ask you, Lord, as well, to give us the capacity to concentrate, to be able to... Um, the, 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 fle the flesh uh, is, is so weak, Lord. The spirit is willing, the flesh is so weak. Help us in our flesh, Lord. Grace upon us in our flesh, that our minds would be alert and able to understand. In Jesus, thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's have some air. Debbie woke up this morning and she said to me, is it going to be a rainy day or a sunny day? And I said, it's going to be a sunny day today, Richard. I said, because I could feel it in the expectation of the atmosphere. And uh, there's a sense in which when we come into the presence of God, uh, we can say, ask the question, is it going to be a rubbish message or is it going to be a, a, a revelationary message? And my hope is that uh, it will be a revelation message to us, Richard. You have to tell us at the end. And you will tell me, I'm sure, Richard. And so um, we, we are kind of... Uh, uh, travelling through Revelations and we're kind of making pit stops in other places but we're kind of coming back to it. Here we are in chapter uh, 3, I think it is, yeah, chapter 3 and we started last week and read Sardis, the church at Sardis and we introduced the concept and now this week we're going to look at, at the church in Philadelphia. That's not the cheese, that's a place uh, in Turkey. Do you want to come up here and just anywhere you like, So, Go on here, Now, Al Sahir, Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. It is a town in the district of <coughs> Manasa province in the Aegean region of Turkey. It is situated in the valley of Kuzukai at the foot of the Bozdag mountain, Mount Smolus in antiquity. The town is connected to Izmir by a 105 kilometer railway. It stands on elevated ground commanding the extensive and fertile plain of the Gediz River. Hermus in antiquity. Presents at a distance an imposing appearance. It has 45 mosques. There are small industries and a fair trade. From one of the mineral springs comes heavily charged water popular around Turkey. As Philadelphia, al Sahir was a highly important centre in the early Christian community. community. Thank you, sir. She did well, didn't she? Give her a clap. Well done, Sue. Well done, Sue. Brilliant. Thank you for that. Uh, when I um, kind of come ac across, uh, you know, stuff like that, it kind of gives us a bit of insight, but it's filled with all sorts of uh, strange words. I give them to someone else to read so that I don't look stupid reading them because <laughs> uh, it's much nicer to spot someone else to try. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Now, let me read. Revelations chapter 3, verse 7. And to the angel, the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, He who is holy, who is true, and who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, and who shuts and no one will open this, says, he says. I know your deeds. Behold, I have put before you an open door, which no one can shut, because you have a little power, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Behold, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, I will cause those of the synagogue of Satan, who say that they are Jews, and are not, but lie, I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and make them know that I have loved you, because you have kept the word of my perseverance. I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world, to test those who dwell on the earth. I am coming quickly. Hold fast what you have, so that no one will take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar 
in the temple of my God and he will not go out from it anymore. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God. The new Jerusalem which comes down out from heaven from my God and my new name. And he who has an ear to hear, let him hear to what the Spirit says to the churches. And if you start to break down, and we are breaking down, some considerations as we travel through and visit these churches via John's letter that was inspired by the Spirit of the living Jesus who is in heaven by the right hand side of the Father. As we begin to break down and inquire somewhat deeper into the journey of these seven churches and God's purpose in writing these letters to them. We get an insight into who they are and what they are and what they're about. And that's good to discover who it is that you are learning about. But we also have to read scripture with a kind of a reflective perspective to understand that what the Bible is saying to another in an experience with God, he is often using those experiences that he's having with him and other people and we can apply those same principles to ourselves. So whenever we read the Bible, we need to read the Bible with our own heart and mind and life reflective of the things that we're about to insight and understand. Because God speaks to us through the word as we understand the experiences that God is encountering with the people. And so the church at Philadelphia was encountering a letter from the living God, Jesus. <clears throat> and we can glean from that reality. So how he approaches and engages with them is the same way he would engage with us also. We can't read the Bible as if it's them and us. We have not understood if we read the Bible like that. We have to read the Bible with the reality of knowing that it's a reflective perspective that we have when we read the Word. That the Word of God becomes life to us because the Spirit brings life from the Word. And so... Jesus presents through John this letter to Philadelphia and he puts it even as we have read it and we could break it down and we will in part. But I'd like to get a broader perspective really of um, those things that often other people don't ask, those things that people often don't inquire of. See, so unlike other letters that John wrote in the other churches, and there were some churches he wrote to, and they had good and bad, and there were some that had not very much good at all. But not this church. Unlike other letters John wrote, John writes to the church at Philadelphia, we have no rebuke now. No rebuke. No rebuke. And as you read through the, the word, you see that there is no secret sin there is no inappropriate history. All the information contained in this letter, this letter, is affirming. It's supportive. And it's reassuring. Now, I don't know whether you ever will, but if you ever end up getting a letter from Jesus, this is the content of the letter that you want to get. You don't want to get the letter that contains other things. No, you want to get the the revelation of affirmation, of support, of reassurance. And when you read the letter to the Philadelphians, the church of Philadelphia, you get the reality of that realised then. And yet even so, even so, though this letter has no negative content in essence, though it makes reference to one or two things, the church is still gone. And <laughs> now there's, what is it, 46 mosques? 45. <clears throat> I hope that ain't prophetic. And, and, and there's 45 mosques there. The church is gone. History tells us that the church disappeared. Now there is a Catholic focus. Now we're not saying that the Catholics are not Christians, but the reality of the disciple in the way that we understand it doesn't exist in that context. 
But if you're going to get a letter from Jesus, get one like this. Make sure it reflects the one that the church got at Philadelphia. And Jesus, like Jesus does, always introduces himself in such a way that authenticates his identity. And I've said this before about the other, the other letters, that Jesus demonstrates declarations that identify who he is and what he is. So if you like, if you was a colonel or a major or you was a, you know, a policeman, you, you say what you are and you command authority by the reality of who you are. And so you say, and that's why people have all these uh, names and numbers and, and initials behind them, because they want to create an authority to their posture so that when they speak, you listen. And Jesus does a similar thing, really. And he presents in all the letters, but in this one in Philadelphia, he presents himself in this way, to authenticate the reality of his identity, to show who he was. And he uses terms like this. He says, I am uh, the words from him who is holy and true. Jesus says that himself. He says, this letter is from him who is holy and true. And true. Now, no one else in the whole of the world could ever say that and can ever say that. There is no other who is holy and true. You were under no illusions as to who is penning this letter via John's pen, but John is inspired by Jesus. This letter is from him who is holy and true. If you get a letter from him who is holy and true, you better pay attention. You better beware. And he, credit, he creates for himself credibility by declaring who he is because no one else could ever say they were holy and true. Or he says, the one who holds the keys of David. Now to have the keys is to have the right of access, to have the authority to enter and to determine who will come in. Jesus is presenting himself and he's saying to the Philadelphians, I want you, <clears throat> I want you to be encouraged. I want you to be affirmed. I want you to know that he who is about to tell you stuff is worthy of your ear and worthy of your heart. Now we, as human beings, encounter a journey through life that determines how much we will believe the people who speak. And because we live in a time of great deception, and every single one of us has been abused emotionally in the sense that people have made us promises only to discover that those promises were not realised. And we all know in measuring degrees the reality of a broken heart, of a heart that's been determined by some sort of promise that was not realised. And as children, we are very expectant and we believe everything. But as adults, we realise that everything is promised is realised. But I want to tell you today that you listen to the word of God. Because when the word of God speaks to you and tells you stuff, he is coming from him who is holy and true. He is him who holds the keys. And when you read the Bible and you read the revelation of Jesus' heart, you need to believe because he is worthy. And that part of you that will not believe, that's reflective in Mark 10 when he says, I do believe, but help my unbelief, you have got to somehow train that part of you to believe again, that you might take hold of the things of God. Let's say you find themselves just whistling over your head and you have no truth, even though you know the truth. Because if you don't know the truth in the encounter of your heart, you don't know the truth. You might know the truth, but you don't know the truth. And so it is. He presents himself in this way. The one who holds the keys, who determines who's going to come in and who is not. So if he decides to open, he decides. If he decides not to open, he decides. Because whoever holds the key determines the outcome. The authority rests with him. Like Sardis, Jesus says, I know your deeds. Now, unlike Sardis, you didn't want to hear that. And I said that at that time when I spoke to you about Sardis. 
the Lord says to you, I know your deeds. And if that makes you feel uncomfortable, <laughs> then you need to do some business with Jesus. But here in Philadelphia, when Jesus said to them, I know your deeds, they did not feel the reality. There was no shame. There was no guilt. There was no sordid revelation. But it gives us an opportunity to ask a question as we encounter this. Can we not sin? Is it possible for a Christian to be perfect on the earth? And uh, I used to have a friend who used to say to me, Paul, <clears throat> can you be perfect for one second? The word perfect and complete are the same word. So he would say, Paul, can you be perfect for, for one second? And I reckon, I said, no, I reckon I could manage that. <clears throat> I reckon I could do a second. He said, how about a minute? So I thought about it and I thought, do you know Give a push, I could travel a minute. And then he, and he said, how about an hour? And I thought, mm, an hour might be stretching it. Might be stretching it. I wonder how long you would last, how long you could do. Is it possible for a Christian not to sin on the earth? And yet the reality of our condition in terms of who we are is you see, what we do, that's the way we live our lives, or who we are, that's who we were in terms of the rebellious sinner that we were, or in terms of who we are now in our redeemed state, state that is the, the, the reality of our salvation. So what we do, the way we live our lives, who we are, the redeemed saints, and who we were, the rebellious sinners, the sinners, sinners, sinners. So then ask the question, do rebellious sinners, do rebellious sinners, uh, interact with me now, let's have some fun. Do rebellious sinners sin? Yes. I'll try again. You're a bit all off key. Do rebellious sinners sin? Yes. Do rebellious sinners do good? Yes. Try that one again. Do rebellious sinners do good? Yes. yes. Okay, so rebellious sinners sin, and rebellious sinners do good. But does that change who they are? They're still rebellious sinners, even when they do good. So the essence of doing good is not just for the saints. The saints ask the question about the saints. Do saints sin? Let's try again. Do saints sin? Yes. Okay. Do saints do good? Yes. Does that change who they are? No. No. So we're not changed or transformed by what we do and what we are in terms of the actions. When we become redeemed saints, no matter how much we sin, we never lose the reality of who we are even though we have just sinned. And when the, the sinners do good, that does not change the reality of who they are. Because access into the heart of the Father does not come from doing good. It comes from who you are. And who you are in terms of whether you're a saint or a rebellious sinner is determined by your response to the message of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He who is holy and he who is true. And so the church at Philadelphia, they were given by Jesus a declaration and Jesus says of them this, you have little strength. You have little strength. And whenever I get stuff like that, I think, that's a, you know, what does that mean? Jesus, what did you mean when you said they have little strength? I mean, were they kind of like Popeye without the spinach? You know, those of you who remember Popeye yeah. would laugh. Those of you who don't, won't, so that insults me. But there we are. You have little strength. I wonder what he meant. Were they as small in number 
you know, there wasn't a large number of people, therefore they had little capacity to accomplish. Was that what he was saying? Uh, was it the fact that they had been afflicted in some way with sickness and therefore the strength in the natural in terms of their health had made it such so that they were now weak in their ability to be strong because sickness had robbed them of good health? Or was it because they had encountered great persecution and, by the, and, and as a byproduct of persecution, they were feeling weak and worn down and weary? And maybe some of you are feeling like that, that life has beat you up or sickness has overcome you. Or maybe we feel like there's just not enough of us to do what needs to be done. What kind of strength was Jesus talking about? It doesn't really matter because despite the problem, he says this of them, even though they had little strength, you kept my word. Done what I told you to do. How often have we let the predicaments of our lives be the reason for not obeying the Lord? But not the church at Philadelphia, and you start to grow to love them. You start, start to get an insight into who they are and what kind of people they are. And they're actually, the, the, Philadelphia actually means loved people. Is it something like that? Loved? City of brotherly love. City of brotherly love. And you start to feel the warmth of that, de that declaration. A city of brotherly love. A people filled with love. You have not denied my name, says the Lord Jesus. The one who is holy, the one who is true. You have not denied my name. Despite the circumstances of life, because life has not treated you so well, you still have remained faithful to me. You have not done what Peter did when Peter was going through a difficult time when it didn't work out in the way that he wanted it to work out. And they asked him three times and he said three times, hey, I don't know him. You didn't do that, Philadelphian church. You didn't do what Peter did. You have stood for what I stand for, he is saying. You have, not, you have not lived a double life, a life of hypocrisy, like Ananias and Sapphira, who tried to deceive the, the, the early disciples by thinking that they were more than they were. And Peter accuses them and says, you tried to deceive God. And brothers and sisters, if you want to learn a lesson today, Learn the lesson. You can't deceive God because he knows your deeds. Whether you're from the church of Sardis or from the church of Philadelphia, he knows your deeds. He knows who you are. And there's no deceiving God. There's no foolishness with God. And yet, despite the reality of who we are and all that God knows about us, it doesn't change us from losing what we are in our redeemed state. God loves us despite what we are. And if you ever hear anything contrary to the truth, that God loves you. But he said, Paul even says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Will one die for a godly man? Hey, may, maybe someone would die for a godly man. But Christ has shown his love for us. Then that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. He who is holy, he who is true, is declaring to the church at Philadelphia and he's declaring to us today, I love you no matter what you are and no matter what you've done and no matter where you've been. I love you with a love that bleeds from a wooden cross 2,000 years ago. If you're ever in any doubt about the reality of God's love for you, see the blood trickle down the cross and know it's for you. It was for you. Jesus will address those, he says in this, in this letter, Jesus will address those who claim to be of my name. And many who say that they are of my name, some are Jews or followers or believers or even Christians, and they say they are of Jesus. They say they are of the name of Jesus. And Jesus says of them, but they are not. And then he says, they are liars. They are liars. Now, now, they are liars. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? He who is holy and true, 
calling you a liar. My God, forgive me. Can you imagine God saying, you are a liar? Brothers and sisters, this, this must be a dreadful thing. He says this, they will come and fall down at your feet. He doesn't say they will fall down at my feet, although there is a time when they will do that because all will fall at his feet. But in this situation, Jesus says, they will come, those who call themselves by my name, those who pretend to be mine, they will come and they will fall down at your feet. And you get the impression that they, they have in some way been wronged by those who are called by, by his name, those who are presenting themselves as believers, but yet are not. You see, the persecutor will bow down to the persecuted. And if there's any justice in this land, if there's any justice in human history, there has to be a place when those who have been obscenely abused are acknowledged by those who abuse them. There has to be justice there. And one day there will be. There will be justice there. They will be humbled and they will acknowledge, Jesus says this, the King of glory. He who tells the truth says this. They will be humbled and acknowledge. And they will say, I love you. They will say I, that he, he loves them. He loves us. And all who obey the will and purposes of God will know the reality of what that means. All who have been unjustly persecuted or suffered by my name. You see, if you suffer because of the wrongs you commit, then in, a, in one sense, so be it. You know, the scripture says, if you suffer for unrighteousness sake, don't start complaining. And yet, he's not talking about the suffering because somehow you suffer inappropriately. No, he says this, he's talking about the suffering unjustly. The kind of suffering that requires the grace of God to sustain you through the difficulty of the trial suffered. He's talking about what Matthew talked about in Matthew chapter 5 when he said, Blessed are you, you are persecuted for righteousness sake, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about that kind of suffering, the kind of suffering when you suffer unjustly. You see, Philadelphia is declared by Jesus, they will, you will be spared the great tribulation the great tribulation that's coming on the whole world. This tribulation that will bring about a change through the trials, a change of character. Our lives are filled with opportunities to change, to be transformed from what we were to what we are. And the journey is the journey. Now God's love for us is no more at the beginning of the journey, is at the end of the journey. He loves us all through the journey. So if we journey through sinning and stumbling, God loves us anyway. So the reality of his love never changes. But this great tribulation, Philadelphia, is spared, which is interesting. And Jesus uses the term here and he says, the hour to come. Now, he's not talking about 60 minutes. He's talking about a time in human history when God stands in judgment of the whole world, when the great trouble, the great tribulation comes upon the land. You see, this is the great climax in human history. The whole world is heading for this day. And everything we are and everything we shall become is pressing home towards that great day.
he says these words. I am coming soon. Now soon, you see, is a relative term. I am coming soon. We sing a song, how long, Lord? How long? Peter tells us, a day is but a thousand years and a thousand years is but a day. Soon, what does soon mean? I have to ask the Lord, Lord, what does soon mean? Please explain to me what soon means. How long, Lord? How long is soon? The early church, the church in Philadelphia and Sardis and all Thyatira, and, and they, they lived with an expectation and an anticipation that he was going to be coming soon that Maranatha would come again. The reality of Jesus' return to bring about this great judgment was imminent. It was, it was coming soon. It was like they were expecting Jesus to be on the next train in the station. That's how expectant they were. They were expectant and they anticipated our brothers and sisters. Today, today, we have not lived as they did. We have become complacent. And our life and our lives and our choices convey the complacency of the concept of the Maranatha Spirit, <coughs> the Lord who is coming again to judge the earth. We have lived in the atmosphere of not any time soon. Not any time soon. Now, I always say this. If they were expectant in him being on the next train in the station and it wasn't realised and many trains have come and gone over those 2,000 years, how much closer are we to the reality of the return of the King of Kings and the one who is holy and true? How much closer are we to the reality of his return? Are we going to be those who Jesus described as the ten virgins who allowed their lamps to not be appropriately attended? In Psalm 119, we studied on Friday, not all of it, but we read a verse there, you remember Anne, and David, if it's David, maybe it's Solomon, we'll see. The psalmist says this, he says, I feel like a stranger on the earth. And brothers and sisters, we are in the world, but we're not of the world. Now that doesn't make us better than the world. I was sharing just in the break. The only difference between those who have yet to discover the truth of the Father's love is they haven't yet heard and believed. But that's a very quick transaction. And they're out there waiting for us to convey the message through the words we speak and the lives we live and the church we are of the Father's love and the restoration that's promised through the cross. Larry Norman wrote a song, I wish they had all been ready. He says to the church of Philadelphia, hold on, hold on to what you have, stand firm, keep resisting the temptation to fall away. Don't fall away from where you are, from what you are, from who you are. Jesus is conveying the possibility in that warning, that the possibility of losing something, the possibility of stepping into eternity without the something that you obtained while you was on the earth was a reality. Don't lose what you are, where you are and who you are. Don't lose your crown. Don't let it be taken away from you. He's saying, 
This is a warning because the crown could be taken away. But to those who get through this, who stand firm, I will make pillars in the temple. And pillars are there to support the temple, the building. It's a significant aspect of the eternal structure that God invites us to be part of. You see, God's plan for all humanity is to be saved. To be a permanent fixture in the temple. And to those who overcome, those, they will be given access to God. And not only will they be given access to God, but they will be given access to God via a new name. And God will reveal a new name to us. We have known Jesus, Saviour. We have known Christ, Messiah. But the church in Philadelphia were going to get access to an insight into a new name in eternity. And all who overcome will get access to a new name. And what that means is we get to have a relationship with Jesus, with God, with the identity of who he is, with his new name. Now, I don't know what that new name is, but it's going to be good. The other two have been brilliant. And we're going to have a new relationship with Jesus in a different way, in the eternal place. He says, thy kingdom will come down from heaven to earth. And the prayer that Jesus prayed on the earth, thy kingdom come on earth, will happen on earth. Heaven will visit earth. Let me pray. Wonderful Father, what can we say? We stand, sit in your presence. You don't condemn us. You don't alienate us. You know everything about us. You've journeyed life with us. What can we say? Except that you are a good, good Father. A gracious God. And today we bow our knee and worship you. We have no other response than saying to you, you are our God. And we love you with all of our hearts. And we pray that you would sustain us in our vulnerabilities, in our weaknesses. We pray that the recovery plan that you have for each individual in this room would never be stolen away. That none would lose their crown that none would drift away from the reality of your love. But even if we do, oh, merciful, graceful God, that your hand would reach into the pigsty and take back your son, your child. Wonderful God, heavenly king, what can we say? Nothing. We have nothing to say. So we ask you now in Jesus' name, to drench us again with your mercy and to use us as we understand your word to affect your world. Hallelujah. Amen.